I now like to talk about the Ricardian School, which is the next major school discussing the how much we should worry about exhaustible resources. And it's named after David Ricardo, who was just like Thomas Malthus, an English economist writing in the early 1800s. Ricardo and Malthus knew each other quite well. They were the two most famous economists in the generation just after Adam Smith. And there's an extensive correspondence between Ricardo and Malthus. Now, the connection between Malthus's ideas and the ideas of Neo-Malthusians, the, the modern ideas that we call Malthusian, are fairly close. If Malthus um, came back to life today, he would recognize the concerns of the Malthusians, of the modern Malthusians, as being related uh, fairly closely to his own concerns. That's actually not true for the Ricardians. Ricardo didn't write about natural resource scarcity per se. Ricardo was writing about the scarcity of agricultural land. And in particular, what Ricardo pointed out is that there are different qualities of agricultural land, not just one quality. If the price of food was high, then you would push agriculture onto rather poor types of land. If the price of food was low, then you abandoned those farms and you only practice agriculture on pretty good quality land. So it's not like a country has a s fixed amount of agricultural land. It has a variable amount of agricultural land, different qualities depending on what the price of food is. So that's what Ricardo wrote. The connection with, with exhaustible resources is a somewhat indirect connection. But the Malthusians basically have this idea, for instance, take something like copper. You have a certain amount of copper, once you run out, there's nothing left. And modern Ricardians, what we call the Ricardian school here of natural resource or thinking about natural resources, is that things are not as stark as the Malthusians suppose them to be. That you have high quality copper deposits, low quality copper deposits. Um, and so you might run out of high quality copper deposits. But there might still be low quality copper deposits that you can extract. For example, if we were to graph tons of mineral, here I mean, ton let's say tons of pure mineral versus, versus uh, resource grade. So you have resource grade is the same as quality. So you have high quality deposits, low, medium quality deposits, low quality deposits. This graph might look like this. So in high quality resource deposits, you might not have much of the mineral. You might and, when, and, and you might run out, or you might be worried about running out once you run out of the high quality deposits. But actually, if you go down to the low quality deposits, there's a whole lot of mineral availability there. So this is a fairly optimistic idea that, yeah, when you go to lower quality or lower grade uh, deposits, it's going to cost you more to extract the mineral, but there's actually a lot of mineral there. However, it's possible that this graph doesn't look like this. It's possible instead that this graph looks like this. And if that's the case, then again, you don't have, well, for high quality deposits, you don't have a lot of minerals. To get down to lower quality deposits, medium quality deposits, let's say there's a lot of stuff there. But if you go to very low quality deposits, actually there isn't a lot of mineral in very low quality deposits. So that's a more pessimistic picture of what this relationship might be. The main point, though, that the Ricardians make is that the horizontal axis is a whole axis. It's not just one resource grade and then you run out, as the Malthusians might say. 
uh, but instead you would gradually run out. First you'd run out of the good stuff, and then you'd run out of the medium stuff, and then you'd have to work with the uh, w with the uh, with the lo with the low quality material. There's a famous uh, uh, graph. It's a actually a graph in your book too. It's not a graph. It's a table. It's box sixteen point one, the McKelvey box. And it's a very nice illustration of Ricardian ideas. So it's a box. And let's say certainty of geological existence. We have high, we have low. So on the left-hand part of the box, we're talking about deposits that we're pretty sure exist. We might not be 100% sure, but they're fairly likely. On the right-hand side, we're talking about deposits which may be there, may not be there. As you go farther and further to the right, it's less likely that the deposits are actually there. Then let's label the vertical axis economic feasibility. You might think of this as being cost. Uh, oh, well, let's say low cost. So feasibility is low cost. So let's say uh, high feasibility which would be low cost and low feasibility which would be high cost. Now the entire box, the whole box, are its reserves. Uh, I'm sorry. <laughs> the whole box is resources. The upper left are reserves. To the upper left, you have high feasibility, which is low cost, and a fairly high certainty of geological existence. So those we call reserves. The entire box is, is resources. And so some of these resources might exist or may end up being way too expensive to ever exploit. And then there are different ways of, des of describing even smaller parts of the McKelvey box. Um, one way, which is not the way that, that your book has it, um, but one way to describe reserves is proved probable and possible. So on the upper left, proved reserves, you're pretty certain they're there, you've taken samples. Probable, you're less certain. Uh, possible, you're even less certain. And then even more to the right, got hypothetical, and speculative. Hypothetical are uh, hypothesized reserves in known districts, and speculative are in undiscovered districts. As I said, the book uses other terminology. I, I won't ask you this particularly on an exam, but on the upper left, the book has identified and on the upper right, undiscovered. And you can, you can look on box 16.1 and page 223 of the book for different kinds of descriptions of these areas of the McKelvey box. But the basic idea is that uh, is, is this, this, the, this notion of different qualities of resource that, uh, that you have, di that, 
the certainty of geological existence varies, that the economic feasibility varies, and so it's not a black and white thing, either you have the resource or you don't have the resource. So that's the difference between the Ricardian school and the Malthusian school, is that in the Ricardian school, uh, in the Malthusian school it's more or less black and white, you either have the resource or you don't. In the Ricardian school there are many more gradations, it's a lot more subtle. And finally I want to talk about the cornucopian school. The a cornucopia is an image that you see often in Thanksgiving. Uh, let's say in advertisements about Thanksgiving. It's a cone made out of straw which has lots of fruits and vegetables in it uh, symbolizing a uh, good harvest. So the cornucopians think natural resource scarcity is no big deal, there's nothing to worry about. And a famous cornucopian was Julian Simon. He was a professor at the uh, in the economics department at the University of Maryland. In the 1990s, he wrote a book called The Ultimate Resource, in which he said the ultimate resource is humans, or people. And as long as you have enough people, you'll have enough human ingenuity to figure out the solution to all resource problems. So for example, England spent hundreds of years cutting down its forests. Well, in the time of Robin Hood, there were also forests in England. Now there aren't. But that didn't turn out to be a problem, because after they cut down all the trees, they just switched to using coal to heat their houses. So that's the kind of example Simon, Simon gives, that you don't have to worry about natural resource scarcity, because people will be clever enough to figure out substitutes for the resources that got exhausted. Critics of the cornucopians say, well, there are other societies that never did find a substitute for the resource that went, um, uh, that, 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 that became extinct or, or became into short supply. And those societies collapsed, and we only read about them in history books. So we don't think about them very much, but they certainly happened. So sometimes natural resource scarcity does cause a society to collapse, but those aren't obvious anymore. You have to be some kind of student to be studying or reading a history book in order to learn about them. So, um, so Simon's idea uh, was that resources are, are not a fundamental uh, problem, that with enough uh, engineers, you can figure out solutions to any kind of resource problem. So these are the three main schools of thought of, about whether we should worry about natural resource scarcity or not, especially exhaustible resource scarcity or not, the Malthusian, Ricardian, and the Cornucopian.